Hello, this is Pastor Steve Wahlberg with Whitehorse Media. What you are about to hear is a dramatized story of last day events taken from a small book entitled Now, currently published by Pacific Press. This dramatized version was originally commissioned by Cyril Miller when he was president of the Chesapeake Conference. Many will recognize the voices of those of your story hour. Before Elder Miller died, he gave the reel-to-reel tape to my friend Art Humphrey, formerly with 3ABN, and asked him to do something with it. After checking with your story hour, Art passed a digital version on to me, hoping that Whitehorse Media would spread it around, which is exactly what we are doing. This story will inspire, especially young people around the world, to be faithful to Jesus Christ in the coming crisis. Please feel free to download this and share it. To discover the Bible teachings behind this story, we encourage you to read the book The Great Controversy by Ellen G. White or the pocketbook God's Final Warning, The Three Angels' Messages, available from White Horse Media. I suppose the excitement of the last few weeks and the drone of the car's motor had taken their toll. How long I had been asleep, I didn't know. My mind was just spiraling upward to consciousness when the familiar green and white signs swept past. Instantly, I was awake. An explosion of thoughts and memories began to tumble into place. I glanced at my brother, Ron, in the back seat beside me. He said nothing, and I knew he too had seen the sign. Kalamazoo, next exit, one mile. In the front seat, Mr. and Mrs. Cook were also silent. I felt strangely empty. How many times had I seen that sign? I couldn't remember. But this time, it had a new meaning. I would be leaving behind my home, family, church, and friends. My thoughts drifted homeward and back to that day when I had been sitting comfortably in the front room watching TV. Mother was preparing supper, and Father would soon be home further uprisings. Today in Paris, the president, along with government leaders of England, France, China, and Russia, signed a peace pact. It is the first time in history that so many government leaders have completely agreed to such a peace document. Momentarily, I ignored the announcer and reflected that this had hardly come as a surprise. News reports of the past few weeks had indicated that such a peace pact would soon be signed. I focused again on the newscast. ...private and church-related institutions. The Supreme Court has finally okayed the much-debated National Sunday Sabbath Law. The bill declares Sunday to be the one and only day on which all are compelled to worship. The President expressed approval of the bill, and during his... The knob felt cold in my hand as I snapped off the TV. I walked over to the window and stared out unconsciously. Memories of a recent Bible doctrines class flooded my mind and I could hear Elder Brown as he quoted Mrs. White's warning that the passing of a national Sunday law was a sign for us to leave the cities. Back there in class, the ideas of Sunday laws and the time of the end had seemed so remote, like it would never happen. Now it was here. But where would we go? When would we leave? It was all so unreal, like a dream. I couldn't believe it was here. Now, Mother broke my reverie. Alice, come to supper. Okay, okay, Mom, I'm coming. In tense quietness, I ate, wishing someone would mention passage of the Sunday law. I had planned how I wanted things to work out when this time arrived. Father would suddenly become converted, and as a united Christian family, we'd move to some secluded place. I waited, but no one seemed to know what to do or say. They acted as if nothing was out of the ordinary. Finally... Well, my family certainly is talkative tonight. Would someone like to tell me what the trouble is? Well? Well, it's it's that... Well, I suppose you know the Supreme Court okayed the Sunday law today. Oh, no. Sis, really... Well, the time of the end is near. We know that. Yes, but the Sunday law, doesn't that have some special meaning? 
Well, you know what Mrs. White says. No. She... Just what does Mrs. White say? Well, she says that a decree enforcing the papal Sabbath is a sign for us to move out of the city into the wilderness. I read that just the other day in volume five of the testimonies. Just tell me, little Miss Holy Joe, exactly where are you going to find any wilderness around here? Well, how about up north? There are really big forests there. No one would find us for weeks. With Ron's suggestion, our conversation had stopped. For Mom and Dad's cold indifference gave us no desire to continue. The week passed, and tension mounted at home. At church, however, things seemed to go more as I had planned. Elder Jenkins delivered a stirring message on the Sunday law and the nearness of Christ's second coming. Many wiped their eyes, and there were hearty amens. Oh, I felt strengthened and reassured. The service ended, and I turned to leave. Say, Bob, that certainly was a powerful sermon Elder Jenkins gave. Yes. Yes, time is short. Oh, say, before I forget it, have you moved into your new house yet? Well, the uh, wife and I are planning on stopping by. Boy, that sure is a beaut. How much did they soak you for her? I got a real deal on this one. Racing cam, heavy-duty trans, and rear end, with plenty of cubes to, to spare in the mill. The price was I was right. stunned. I couldn't understand it. How could anyone be so moved by God and forget so quickly? Didn't they realize what was happening? As the days passed, the situation at home became unbearable. Finally, Mother and Dad gave permission for Ron and me to leave home and to live in our lake cottage. Sis? Yes, Ron? I was just thinking. The sun's about to set on our first Sabbath since we left home. Oh, it's been a wonderful Sabbath, spent in the peace and quiet of the country. You know, I think this is the best Sabbath I can remember. Yes. I was thinking the same thing. The hours have passed all too quickly. Why, we've studied and prayed all day, something we've never done before. Well, it's as if we'd been pushed on by some great urgency. You know, Alice, speaking of urgency, we don't know exactly when probation will close. We read that just today in the little book, Final Crisis and Deliverance. So, so why don't we give Bible studies to our neighbors? We could start tomorrow. Having never given a Bible study before, we were nervous. But we had asked God to lead us, and we met a very lovely family, the Cooks. They had heard of Adventists and were interested in our study. They accepted the message, and although they were never baptized by water, they became Seventh-day Adventists by the baptism of the Spirit. Hello? Hello, Alice. Oh, hi, Mom. It's so good to hear your voice. How's Dad? Fine. I called to see if you and Ron were ready to come home. You've been gone over a week now. Father could drive up and get you tomorrow. No, Mom. We've prayed about it, and we're not coming home. Oh, Mom, why don't you come up here with us? Things are happening so fast, and, and the time is so short. No, Alice. I can't leave home. Or your father. No amount of persuading would cause Mom to change her mind. It was with a heavy heart that I said goodbye. Later, I phoned Elder Jenkins, hoping that he and his family would soon be moving. But to my surprise, everything seemed to be the same as usual there, too. Everyone was happy and friendly, and no one was planning to do anything but go on just like they always had. Several times, Elder Jenkins warned me to beware of becoming fanatical. Oh, why did it have to happen? Why couldn't it wait till I died so I wouldn't have to be hurt by family and friends who rejected the call? Why must it happen now? Why, Mrs. Cook, please come in. Ron and I were just starting dinner. Would you Alice, care to... Alice, listen. The Universal Sunday Law has been passed. It was just announced on the radio. Probation is closing and the plagues will soon start. 
We're going to have to leave here and find a hiding place in the mountains. Yes, the time had come. The time was now. After much deliberation and prayer, we decided on going to the Smokies. Ron and I quickly packed a few belongings, took a last look around, locked our cottage door, and were waiting when the cooks drove up. Alice, you and Ron put your luggage in the back seat and jump in. We'll ask our Heavenly Father's protection and then start south immediately. The last Kalamazoo exit sign appeared, then faded into the distance, and with it, my thoughts of the past. I knew now I wouldn't be going home again, ever. Yes, there goes everything. Everything, I thought. But no, not everything was gone. I turned to Ron. It's just you and me now, Ron. Just us. Oh, no, no, not just us, sis. We've got God. He's everything we need. Oh, I guess I knew that, really. But there are times I feel so unsure. Oh, Ron, sometimes I worry that maybe we have deceived ourselves into thinking we are saved when we really aren't. That by running we are trying to prove to ourselves, and yes, to even prove to heaven, that we deserve the seal of God. Alice, I couldn't help but hear your conversation. I'd like to suggest we keep in mind God's promises that to him who is victorious will be given the right to the tree of life, and also that the victorious cannot be harmed by the second death. And while you were sleeping, sis, I found a statement in Steps to Christ, which is a great comfort. It says that we must accept the promises of Christ, not from feeling, but out of faith. And we have so many examples of God's care for us. Why, all we have to do is, is look back over the past few weeks and and we can see how the Lord has guided us. Strange, I thought, that he should have read that statement just when I needed it. I looked at Ron and noticed how much he had matured in the last weeks and how Christ-like he seemed. Out of the car's window, the miles and scenes seemed to merge into one another. And I thought of my childhood friends and grade school teachers I wondered if they were running to hide as we were. My heart ached as I realized how very little I had done to show them the way. I felt sure Elder Brown and Elder Jenkins must have fled by now and hoped that maybe at the very last moment mother and dad had left the city. Troops were finally able Mrs. To Cook the riots had turned on the car radio to a news broadcast and the announcer was telling of more riots, tornadoes, wars and strife. Every broadcast was so much alike I hardly listened until suddenly enacted Sunday law and that this law carries with it the death penalty for all violators. The law will become effective midnight of the first Sunday of next month. So now we knew within a few weeks it would be permissible to kill us. We finally reached the foothills to the Smokies. They looked like heaven to us. In one town, we stopped at a gas station. Yes, sir. All of me today. Uh, fill it up, please, uh, with regular. Okay, come right up. Oh, by the way, may I see your purchasing permit? Uh, I'm sorry, I, I, I don't have one. You, you see... Well, buddy, there'll be no gas for you. We've got to get out of here. I think that man's going to call the police. But where can we go? We're almost out of gas. Pray. Just pray that God will direct us. The gas gauge did register empty, but the car ran perfectly. We threaded our way up one street and down another. Breathlessly, we listened on the radio for the announcement we knew would come. We, we didn't have this long to wait. Police are looking for a car bearing the license number PD-3001. The auto was last seen leaving a gas station at the corner of 3rd and Vine. The passengers are enemies of the state and are accused of disrupting law and order I couldn't believe they were talking about us as I heard the list of crimes we had supposedly committed. How could this be? Oh, especially here in the United States. 
But then I recalled reading in the book Final Crisis and Deliverance how those honoring the Bible Sabbath would be denounced as enemies of law and order. It was happening just as we had been told. Suddenly... Listen, kids. Grab what you can and get out of here as fast as possible, without looking suspicious. It's not safe for you to be with us. Oh, but... Do as I said. Now. For a moment, we just stood there numbly, holding our coats and Bible, wondering where to go. Come on, sis. We better start walking. Oh, oh of all things, I grabbed my roller bag. How in the world did I get that? <laughs> Typical woman, I guess. I don't know. Here, hey, let's turn down this street. This will shortcut us through the residential section and out into the country. It's so peaceful and quiet here. It's hard to believe anything is wrong. Children playing, people watering lawns, or washing windows. Everything seems so normal, maybe... Come on. Come on, we'll go between these two brick buildings. The buildings were just to our right at the end of a small street. We dashed between them and found ourselves in a sort of alley littered with boxes and barrels. Oh, why would there be something like this in a residential district? Now listen, will you stop trying to figure everything out? Not just hide. Here, here, get under this box. Now lie down and I'll cover you over with these old rags. Oh, I love you, sis. Now, remember, Romans 8, 28. The box came down, and I was enveloped in a suffocating silence. Dust and the stench of the dirty rags filled my nostrils, making it difficult to breathe. I lay in a cramped position, and soon tired muscles began aching for relief. But I scarcely noticed, for my heart cried out to God continually in prayer, longing for the relief of forgiven sins. An eternity of silence passed. Then I remembered Ron's suggestion and found comfort in the promise of Romans 8.28. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. Alice? Alice? Everybody seems to be gone. I think it's safe to come out now. Here, here, let me help you. Oh. This cold night air is so refreshing. Mm. Oh, but I'm so stiff and sore I can hardly move. I know, I know. We'll have to leave town by the highway for a ways until we're out in the country. Now watch carefully. Okay, let's go. The town slipped slowly into the darkness behind us. Our fears grew. Every time a car passed, we threw ourselves to the ground. Then, got up and ran. We ran faster and faster. We fell down, grasping the ground, hoping no one would see us. As the car sped down the highway, we were again on our feet, again running, running. The cool night air burned my throat. My side ached, and my legs began to feel numb and heavy. Stop! Uh. Stop, I can't go any farther. You can't stop. Hit the ground. Here comes another car. Oh. Now, now I know how a hunted animal feels. Oh, come on, Alice. Get up. Oh, Ron, I can't. All oh, this cool ground feels so good. I can't get up now. I've got to rest. Now, you cut it out. You know we have to run while we can. What happens when the sun comes up and we're still out here by the road? Now, look, we're, we're almost to the hills. You can make it with God's help. Let's go. We have to go now. That was it. Everything was now. Now we had to run and fall. Now we had to hide. Why couldn't it happen next year? Why did everything have to happen now? At last, at last we reached the hills and began working our way back into the woods. In the east, the sky was growing pink, but we kept walking. A sort of numbness crept over us, drowning the pain. I wanted a drink of water. My throat was so dry it hurt to swallow, 
Finally, we fell to the ground exhausted and slept. Shafts of sunlight pierced the green leafy boughs high overhead and splashed down on us. It was day. Alice. Alice. Wake up, Alice. Come on, sis. Better get up. It's almost noon. Did you sleep well? Oh, yes. I feel as if I've slept for a hundred years. <laughs> Let's have worship before we leave. Here. You read a few verses, and, and I'll close with a verse or two. I took the Bible and opened it. It fell open to some underlined verses of Psalm 27. I read, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. My heart went out in love to God. I was a daughter of God, a princess, a princess of the highest government of the universe. Now pain and suffering meant nothing, and I no longer ached anymore. The gathering shadows of night found us creeping still deeper into the forest. Say, Ron, do you know what day this is? It's Friday night, the Sabbath. Let's have Vespers, right here, now. Very quietly, almost silently, we had a worship service. There, with the celestial ceiling above us, and surrounded by giant pillars of God's creation, we felt his presence draw near. When we finished, we felt refreshed and encouraged to face the day and its demands. We were deep in the mountains by the time the sun spilled over the eastern ridge, filling the valleys with warmth and beauty. We both paused to drink in the splendor, then knelt to thank God for his loving care. We had just risen when we heard a yell. We turned and saw two men with rifles and a dog. Hey, you! What are you doing there? Ron gave me a shove. Get, get along, Alice. You go that way, and, and I'll go this. Remember, Philippians 4, 13. I turned and plunged into the thick undergrowth. Blindly, I ran. The men were screaming, and the dog sounded half-crazed. My side hurt, and my throat ached, but I ran. And always there was the dog. I kept running. Oh, help me, dear God. Please help me. One of the rifles went off. I stiffened, but felt nothing. Another shot, but still I was not hit. On and on I ran, the dog getting closer. Please don't let them catch me. Why couldn't I run faster? Suddenly I was falling. I tried to get up, but it was too late. The dog was upon me, and right behind him, the two men. One of the men raised his rifle and took aim. This is it, I thought. Hey, the Lord I'm going to affect him next month. What you doing grabbing my arm like that? <laughs> you might spoil my aim. <laughs> Besides, what's the difference whether we kill him now or later? Well, why don't you take her into the authorities like everybody else is doing? Besides, you'll have plenty of hunting time in the next few yeah. weeks. Yeah, all right. All right, now, come on. Get on your feet, Matt. You're going to jail. Yeah, it's too bad that other kid got away. Oh, well. <laughs> You'll be caught tomorrow. <laughs> At least Ron was still free, for which I thanked our Heavenly Father. At the prison, I was questioned, fingerprinted, questioned again, then made to change into prison garb and led to a cell. As I approached, I saw several already in the cell. Hello, little one. Welcome to our cell. Yes, welcome. Won't you have a seat? We were just having church. You can be our visitor this week. If we had a guest book, you could sign it. Thank you. Our service consists mostly of singing. Why don't you join us? We were singing Faith of Our Fathers when you came in. Now let's everyone join in on the last two stanzas. Our fathers chained in prisons dark were 
the seat offered me was a place on the floor at log one wall and was just big enough to squeeze into. I sat down gratefully. Tom, the man who had welcomed me and called me little one, made me feel right at home. I called him Tom because that's the only name he gave. He seemed different from the others, more friendly, kinder. Aunt Nellie was the woman who welcomed me. The singing was sincere, and the song so real, not just words set to music, as it had often been at home. As the day lengthened, we sang and prayed and talked some more. Many fine testimonials of Jesus' saving power were given. One man beamed as he told how the men who captured him tried to shoot him, but their guns wouldn't go off. I thought of my own narrow escape and thanked God again for his protection. After a while, I felt hungry. Do they ever feed you here? Yes, yes. Once in a while, they give us a little something. <laughs> oh, well, I've been on diets before, so I guess this will be nothing new. Well, now we have three more visitors, including a very frightened little girl. All right, inside with you. Greetings, friends. We've just finished our worship service, and it'll be a while before mealtime, so we may as well take the opportunity to get acquainted. I'm Tom. This is Aunt Nellie, the Smith family, Mr. Smith, his wife. Tom introduced each one, and then turned his attention to the little girl, who had started to cry for her mother. Soon he had her smiling, and we learned her name was Judy. How reassuring it was to find such companionship within prison walls. Like Paul, I felt that I was a prisoner of the Lord, rather than imprisoned by men. But as the minutes dragged, the buoyant effects of song and conversation were slowly replaced by a meditative silence, and each retreated to his own thoughts. All my life I had heard how we should be like Christ, but now I wondered if I reflected his image fully. I was afraid I'd forgotten to confess some sin. Oh, if I could only know for sure. Then Tom came over and sat down beside me. Don't be discouraged, little one. We can't know everything right now. Just remember, no matter what, that God's love for you is as strong as it has ever been. He hasn't failed you yet, and he's not going to. Remember, Christ went through all this and more for you. He feels every pain, every ache, every discouragement you have. He is listening and watching you, and he loves you very deeply. And you're a perfect princess. He turned and walked to the other side of the cell, and I wondered, how did he know of my discouragement? How could he know about my being a princess? A strange feeling crept over me as I tried to comprehend just what kind of person Tom was. Then he turned and smiled, and I knew he was just a wonderful, wonderful Christian man. All right, here you are. Here's your soup. Now, each of you take a bowl as it's passed in. You know, this might be the last meal for some of you. I don't understand you people. Never could figure out why people break the law. It's the ones back home who suffer. Don't you care about your families? Can't you see they're going to be persecuted because of you? And uh, besides, what gives you the idea that you're so almighty holy? Everyone else is going along with the law but you. Now just who do you think you are to say no to God, huh? People like you are crazy. When an animal's crazy, it's shot. <laughs> he walked away, leaving the unspoken words hanging thick before the cell. Deep inside, I felt sick at the thought of mom and dad suffering because of me. The night wore on, and though exhausted, I found sleep difficult. The light in our cell burned constantly, and every 10 or 15 minutes, a loud buzzer sounded. Tom explained that they wanted to keep us awake, 
because the human body breaks down after extreme insomnia. Just learn to sleep deeply for five or ten minutes and put your trust in God, Tom had counseled, and I found it worked. Sometime during the night, the guard returned to our cell. All right now, I'm going to call some of your names. Now step forward as I read them. William Saunders, Elizabeth May, John E. Judy began to cry, and Aunt Nellie took her in her arms to comfort her. Several names were called, including Tom's. As he passed, he bent over and pressed something into Judy's hand. Then he looked at me. Take good care of her, little one, and remember to pray. Follow me. For a moment, I listened to their fading footsteps. Then I turned my attention to Judy. Oh, look! Look what I have! Why, Judy, wherever did you get that? Tom gave it to me when he went out. Isn't it pretty? Oh, yes, Judy, honey. It's beautiful. In her hand, Judy held a small, brightly colored picture of Jesus. On the back, it read, God is love. How had Tom been able to get that in here, I wondered. We had all been very carefully searched when we entered prison. I wondered, as I remembered his kind face and friendly smile. I wondered. After that, we were left alone for two days, without food or water. Our hunger and thirst became acute. But even worse than our physical discomfort was the fear that all our sins had not been forgiven that we were not ready to meet our Lord. I searched my heart, trying to find any hidden sin, and prayed earnestly for forgiveness and strength. Richard the next Wright. day, the guard now appeared and called more names. My Henry name was Jones. among them. Don't go away, Bob Alice. Williams. I don't want you to leave me. Don't cry, honey. Everything will be fine. Remember the picture Tom gave you. Goodbye, dear. Goodbye, Alice. Goodbye. All right, follow me. Now I was scared. I wondered what happened to people after they left the cell. Now stop here. Alice Strong, right this way. I was in a small room. A man was sitting on the other side of a large desk. He looked up. Are you Alice Strong? Yes. You live in Kalamazoo, Michigan? Yes. You're a Seventh-day Adventist? Yes. Why? Why? Well, because I believe the Bible is the one and only rule of faith, and Seventh-day Adventists base all their beliefs on the Bible. Oh. Sit down, Alice. Uh, all right, now. That's better. You know, I like you. I like your answer. You seem to be sensible, level-headed. Now, you say all your doctrines are based on the Bible. Isn't that right? Yes, yes, they are. Then how is it that you don't believe in immortality of the soul? In my Bible, I read where the poor man, Lazarus, was in heaven and the rich man in hell after they died. I'm sure you're familiar with that story. And what's more, Jesus himself told it. But you must understand That's that enough. This... You're not to speak unless I instruct you to do so. Another thing is the Sabbath keeping. Now, the Sabbath was kept by God's people through the Old Testament. This line of questioning startled me. I was given no chance to answer or defend my faith. I prayed silently, earnestly for Saturday. divine wisdom to and the strength to face whatever might now, come. You say like a flash, Ron's last and words came to my mind. Remember Philippians 4.13, he had said, Where you go I can do all things in him who strengthens me. What a blessed promise for a time like this. I wondered about Ron now. What had happened to him? Now think about it, Alice. You're an intelligent girl, and I know you're seeking the truth. You think you're doing the will of God, but consider what I've just said. 
You wouldn't want to kill anyone, would you? But some of your friends, or even members of your family, may be killed because you are so stubborn. Don't you think God is going to hold you responsible? Of course, if you were to change to God's way and ask forgiveness for your sins, he could save you before the death penalty goes into effect. I know, it's a big step for you right now. But I tell you what we're going to do. If you want to, we'll send you back to Kalamazoo. And then after you've seen some of your friends and family, you can make your decision. Sound pretty good? Yes. Yes, I would like that. I was led to a small cell, and there I waited. Each day I hoped I would be able to go home, but my home leave didn't come. The days passed. Every few minutes the guard would look through the openings in the door of my cell and wake me if I were sleeping. Every day there were long hours of questioning, long hours of persuasion talks. I thought I would lose my mind. I clung to two verses, If ye love me, keep my commandments. And here is the patience of the saints. Here are they which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. I had to stand firm. I couldn't fail now. I don't know how it happened, but I must have fallen asleep finally, for suddenly I awakened. It seemed as though I'd been sleeping for a long time. The guard, who was usually right outside my cell, was gone. But I sensed someone in my cell. In one motion, I rolled over and sat up. Tom! Tom, how did you get in here? Never mind that, little one. I thought maybe you hadn't had much to eat, so I brought you something. Here, eat all you want. Oh, thank you. Why, why I've never tasted anything like this before. It's delicious. What is it? There really isn't a name for it, but I'm glad you like it. How was Judy when you left her? Pretty good, I guess. Listen, little one, I must warn you. They're going to be real hard on you from now on. You'll be going home soon, but it isn't going to be such a wonderful reunion as you might think. It's going to be hard, but it won't be long. Remember how much Christ loves you. Think of all the good things he has done for you, all the times he has answered your prayers. This is just a test. Think of it as an entrance exam to heaven. And Alice, you'll pass it. Just keep trying and praying, and believe the promises Jesus has made to you. Repeat them, and think only of God, not of yourself, not of your own deficiency, but of Christ's power and strength and love. Tom, you're so much encouragement. You're so kind. I want to be just like you. Don't think of being like me, but like Christ. No one is like Jesus, and to be like him should be the highest goal of everyone. Now you must promise me that you won't get discouraged. I have to leave, but just remember how much Jesus loves you. Please don't go. Oh, please don't. I don't want to be left alone again with the guards looking in all the time. I must go now, but I will see you again soon. I turned my back to hide the tears and walked to the other end of the cell. Why couldn't he stay just for a little while more? I didn't want the guards to wake me up all the time or to make those sly remarks that were so characteristic of them. The guard. Suddenly it dawned on me that the guard hadn't been by for a long time. The whole time Tom had been here. I turned to say goodbye to Tom, but he was gone. Tom! Tom! Hey, will you shut up in there? It had been so good to see Tom. When he was around, there was no pain, no heartache. He seemed to carry an atmosphere of peace and love, of trust and joy, right with him. Now he had gone, and the cell was cold and gray again. I was finally sent back to Kalamazoo. At the jail, I went through the usual procedures and then was taken to a large, nearly empty cell. Abby! Abby! It's so good to see someone I know again. 
Why, I haven't seen you since Academy let out. How long have you been in? About a month, I guess. Is it rough here? Yes, but just pray, Alice, and things will work out all right. Say, have you got any information on the Academy situation? Yes, some. Did the Browns get away? No. I'm afraid they didn't even try. Didn't try? What do you mean they didn't try? They just went along with the law and didn't try to be true. But how can this be? How could this happen to a Bible teacher? Are you sure, Abby? Maybe they changed their minds later and were true. Two miserable days passed, and then the guard came and took me to the courtroom. Entering, I saw Mother, Elder Brown, and Elder Jenkins. A thrill passed through me. There they were. I knew they wouldn't fail. I knew it. I was seated, and then the questioning began, just like the other jail. Only this time there were teams. When one team tired, another would take over. It seemed I was near the breaking point when suddenly the questioning stopped. Well, hello, Alice. I've listened with a great deal of interest to your answers this afternoon. I'm sure you realize where you've made your mistakes. But, Elder Jenkins, you understood that... But surely you can't accept the Sunday law? You, who warned us so many times? It's hard to believe, I know. But when we've been shown new light, and we have, we must accept it. We have had visions. I myself have had some. On these visions, Jesus has told me that the plan has changed. He is going to perfect everyone here by means of the Sunday law. And then no one, not one person, will be lost. Now, do you see what that means, Alice? Everyone will be saved, everyone. Alice, it's people like you that are holding up this process. If you persist in doing wrong... I looked at him with a breaking Sabbath, heart. You'll have to be he believed it. Just as he Old actually Testament believed time, what he was saying. How could he, my you minister, be so Jesus deceived? Now, Elder Brown walked over to me. Well, it's uh, nice to see you again, Alice. I just wish it were under different circumstances. Now, I, I don't want to tell you that you're lost, because we can't know that for sure. But I will tell you that if you don't change, you cannot be saved. You think you're right, but really you are wrong. And you will be punished if you don't straighten up. I urge you to change soon. The death decree goes into effect tomorrow. This couldn't be the Elder Brown who had taught me Bible just a couple of months before. No. I knew he was different. The same person outwardly, but something had happened on the inside. Mother walked over to me. With a look full of hate, she spat the words at me. They killed your father last week. They killed him because of you. You're not a Christian. You're a crazy fanatic. You killed your father. You're the one just as surely as those men who shot him. You deserve to die. Die just like your father died. I looked at the three of them. None of them were the people I'd known. In Bible class, Elder Brown had told how only a very few would be saved. How only those who would rather die than commit a wrong act would stand through the last conflict. I could still hear him say, Some of the brightest lights will go out. Some of the very people who you think are saints, you will find out are really devils. I looked at him now, sitting there with that self-righteous air about him. I wondered if, during our many discussions of this time, and the many statements that he had read and spoken about people falling, if he had ever realized that he was prophesying his own end. Well, <clears throat> what will it be? We've given you more mercy than was necessary. You know very well that you are breaking the law of the state, the church, and the law of God. Well, what do you say? Your Honor, I cannot agree to abide by any law which is not sanctioned or upheld by the truths of the Bible. But I told you, the Bible is no longer in effect. Can't you see what you're doing, you little fool? I looked at the three of them, Mom, Elder Brown, and Elder Jenkins, and felt sorry. Sorry that they couldn't realize what they were doing. 
sorry that they allowed themselves to be deceived. All right, then I sentence you to death by the electric chair tomorrow at midnight. I was taken to a dark cell and left alone. Death wouldn't be half so terrifying if I could be sure that I was prepared to meet my Lord. I had to know for sure that I had no sin on the books, but how could I? In anguish I poured out my soul unto God. If only I could remember some sin that needed forgiving, but my memory was black. Too soon, I was walking to the execution chamber. I had to be convinced that I was sealed. I had to know, now. I was fastened in the chair. The electrodes were placed on my head. The man walked over to the switch. Suddenly, the lights went out. Everyone began screaming. The building reeled back and forth. The straps holding me broke, and I ran from the chair. Everything about us seemed to be breaking in the wild thunder. The end of the world! I'm to be lost. Oh, lost. I dashed out into the street. There seemed to be a great light everywhere. People were running about madly, trampling and killing each other. Anything to get away from the light, the beautiful light. The earth was heaving like a sea. Giant cracks appeared, and people pleading for death threw themselves into them. Fire blazed everywhere. White fire flashed through the black sky, and in the middle of the blackness was the light. As I watched, I grew happy, happier than words can express. At last, at last, Jesus had come. He was here. Had I been hurt, had I been sad, or discouraged, or hungry, or thirsty. I couldn't remember. All I knew was that I was finally going home. The earth was hushed now. There were only a very few of us on the street. We watched with mounting excitement as the cloud drew nearer and then stopped. Raising his nail-scarred hands, Jesus called to the dead. Suddenly the earth opened and hundreds of glorified people came up out of it. We all joined together in a long, loud shout of victory. And what a victory it was. Angels came earthward as those who had just risen were caught up in the air. The angels came closer to us who were still waiting. They felt warm and bright and I could see the happiness shine right through them. My angel was beside me as I began to rise towards Jesus. I looked around, and there was Ron. An angel was beside him, too, and together they were flying to the cloud above us. The cooks were there, and others I had known. The thrill, the miraculous glory of it. I was going home to Jesus. I had made it, just like Tom said. Then my angel touched my arm. Yes, little one. You made it. Tom! Oh, Tom! My heart was so full of joy that I felt it would burst. But I couldn't look at Tom very long. There was someone else I had to keep my eyes on. Someone more beautiful, more lovely and kind than even Tom. Jesus looked at us as we came to him. He looked at me with the most wonderful, love-filled look I had ever received. And then he smiled. His smile was so beautiful, so glorious. He had come, and I was happy. Happy everything had happened. Now. We hope you enjoyed today's message by Steve Wolberg. We feel privileged to be a part of God's commission to share the gospel with the world. You too can be a part of our gospel outreach team by supporting messages just like these with your financial gifts. We strive to be careful with every dollar that we receive, knowing these donations are sacred gifts to build up God's kingdom of grace and salvation. To find other great resources or to donate online, go to whitehorsemedia.com. 
or you can call us at 1-800-78-BIBLE. That's 1-800-782-4253. You can follow us on Twitter at Whitehorse7 or on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash Steve Wolberg. That's Steve, W-O-H-L-B-E-R-G. If you prefer to contact us by mail, write to Whitehorse Media, P.O. Box 130, Priest River, Idaho, 83856. Thanks for your support, and may God richly bless your day.